Good morning. My name is Peter Bassford, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Global Enterprise Week. In this first session, I'm going to do four things. Talk to you about my journey, interview a young entrepreneur who trained at West Suffolk College and now has a growing and thriving business. And I'm going to give you a challenge for this week, which on Friday, the winner will receive an iPad. And along the way, I'm going to share with you some more information on some of the great people we've lined up to speak to you this week. So let's get straight on with it, shall we? So my story, well, I'm a Berry boy. I love Berry St Edmunds and I love Suffolk, and I'm really proud to come from here. I started my working life in Berry just along Risbygate Street at Lloyd's Bank, the one that's closed by the roundabout now. We used to have 100 people working there back in the early 90s, and now it's derelict. I've moved through various jobs in East Anglia and became um, the senior manager at Lloyd's Private Banking in Norwich, which was my first sort of leadership role um, back in the mid-90s. I was one of the youngest senior managers in the group. How did I do that? I wasn't the brightest student. I messed up my A-levels, actually. Um, I was more interested in doing other things than studying. But what I did do when I started working was I threw all my energy into it. And I got noticed as somebody who got things done, um, that was keen and enthusiastic, and got known as somebody who could help. Looking back now, it's what people now call a growth mindset. I just used to think about wanting to do things and learn lots. Then when I went to Norwich, um, I learned a lot. It was my first leadership role. I made loads of mistakes, um, but I was bright enough to work out what I did wrong as well as what I did right and actually did okay. Um, and then Lloyd's came and said, would I like to go to the Northeast? So I moved to me and my family up to the Northeast to Newcastle, where I ran Lloyd's private banking for the Northeast and Cumbria. When I left Berry, I remember saying to my mum and dad, I'd be away for two years um, and not to worry. It was just a bit of a tour of duty and I'd be back home soon. I ended up staying in the Northeast for 16 years and I did lots of different roles for the bank, both regional ones and national ones. Um, and started two new businesses for the bank within that, one of which went from having 10 people on day one to 76 people and we were making 32 million pound profit for the bank in, the, in its most successful times. So why was I successful? I think I was clever enough to realize a long while ago, I was good at what I was good at, but I wasn't good at everything. Um, and it was really important to have good people or better people than me around me um, who, had, who were much more knowledgeable and much more skillful. I'm a naturally nosy person. I'm quite sympathetic. And I was able to get on with people and help them become a better team. Leadership for me is about three things. Genuinely caring about the people you work with and, and their families, and also believing in the people you work with much more than they believe in themselves, because they can achieve great things more than they expect that they can. It's then about setting a clear direction so that everyone knows what is expected of them and what will happen when everyone pulls together and then celebrating the successes as a team. And as a leader, reminding them on a regular basis of where we're going and what still needs to be done. Bring us up to date. I returned to Suffolk in 2014, back to Bury and back to my roots. And I led the commercial banking team for Suffolk. And we looked after businesses with turnover of 25 million or more for the last four years. That team went from being bottom nationally to top nationally in those four years as we got out and about, worked with more Suffolk businesses um, and got known as a good place to talk to as a bank locally. When I left Lloyd's in 2018, I set up Business Growth Coaches Network, my own business, which did the same thing, um, got out and helped businesses to be successful. Um, helping them to grow and using all of the skills and knowledge I'd picked up during my time in banking. Two years on, 
we now have 25 coaches and over 100 clients across the country and continue to grow at a pace. I also co-founded the Innovation Lab in Stone Market, where I am today, a place where people can set up their businesses and have support from the other members and the three of us as co-founders. And we currently have 25 free virtual memberships available until the end of November. So if anyone on this call, so if that is of interest to any of you budding entrepreneurs out there, then please do get in touch with me after this call. Later this week, you'll hear from Hermione Way, one of my co-founders, about her business journey and her involvement with the Innovation Lab. Um, she worked for Tinder as their marketing director um, and, and will tell you her story of coming from San Francisco to Suffolk. So look out for that one. As I said earlier, I'm passionate about Suffolk. I'm a Suffolk ambassador and I also chair a group called FIPS, the Financial Insurance and Professional Services Group um, for the county, which brings together all types of financial services businesses, solicitors, accountants, financial advisors, to promote Suffolk as a great place to work. You will hear from Richard Brain this week, who is the director for Willis Towers Watson in Ipswich. And he will talk about jobs in the insurance sector. Um, again, what a great place Suffolk is to live and work in. In 2019, I set up the Suffolk Apprentice. It's like the TV show, the app with Alan Sugar, um, but a bit nicer, not so quite so much firing. We interviewed a number of candidates and each month, the candidates did a project for a Suffolk based charity to help the charity as well. And each month we fired somebody until we came down to the last final four by the end of the year. You'll again, you'll hear later this week from the winner, Tom James, who set up Reset and Chill and about how he launched his business. It has changed quite a lot in the, the COVID world um, as it has for lots of us. Uh, we are actually planning to run a new Suffolk Apprentice in 2021. So for all you budding entrepreneurs, look out for that um, session with Tom and think about applying for next year. So do enjoy Global Enterprise Week. Please attend or listen to as many of the great speakers as you can. People like Melanie Banks, who runs John Banks Honda here in Berry, and Sam O'Doherty, um, a young man going places who works for Treat PLC, a very successful Ferris Edmonds and American business. With all these great insights from business and enterprise to share with you, I think you'll have a great week. But to start now, I'm going to introduce you to Ellis Hyes um, from QR Pay. Uh, now he is uh, somebody who went to West Suffolk College and has now got a really interesting tech business. So Ellis, let me introduce you. Hi Ellis. Hello. Really good to see you again. Um, you went to West Suffolk College. I did. What do you do there then? Um, carpentry. Um, so leaving school, I wasn't too sure what I actually wanted to do. Uh, family was always in construction. Um, I enjoyed creating things, making things. So I went to West Suffolk College and trained as a carpenter. Did an apprenticeship there. And how did that go? Uh, quickly realised it wasn't for me. Um, I didn't really enjoy being on the site, so I, I enjoyed making things. I, um, you know, uh, it, it wasn't for me. And I started, that was about sort of when I first started my sort of online journey with my first business. Okay. So a bit different, an online business to being a carpenter, I guess. Yeah. Um, carpentry was, uh, it's, I suppose it was it was a job that though I enjoyed in my free time, it wasn't something that I wanted to do for a career. I would enjoyed always sort of starting up my own businesses, sort of doing little schemes that I could do to make money. Um, and it was it was probably doing something that I didn't enjoy, which is sort of what gave me the drive to actually sort of start working in my evenings to uh, start something new. Um, set up a little eBay shop, importing some products from China, um, and that was sort of what what got everything going really. Okay. So still building something, but not building it physically, but building a, an online shop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, different altogether, really. It was, um, I, I liked the, you know, one of the things I didn't like when I was a carpenter was the fact that I'd go to work and my wage was set at a daily rate. Um, you know, and that, 
I did enjoy that. I wanted to sort of not have any limits to what I could earn, what I could do, what I could build. Um, you know, and, and I could do that when I was selling online. Um, there was, you know, I started out on eBay. I, I moved on to Amazon as well, selling. And there's, you know, there's no caps as to how big you can build something. Wow. So Amazon and eBay then, two big players you started working with. Yeah. Um, very early on, I eBay was always much bigger for me. Um, Amazon, right. Amazon was always a bit of a challenge. Um, though when I started, probably eBay and Amazon was sort of on par. I mean, Amazon was completely dwarfed eBay now, but I always did a lot better on, on eBay just because of how their search works. Um, okay. So I sold a lot through there, yeah. So give uh, give everybody an idea of how much you were selling on, on eBay and Amazon. Um, <laughs> so I'll give you a bit of a backstory as to sort of the journey I went to with that. So okay. initially, um, I was importing products from China. So I started with bracelets. Um, not really a passion of mine, but I, you know, I could make them and I could sell them and it's, you know, I learned a lot. Um, and then through talking to a family friend, he, uh, he basically made an introduction for me to a UK wholesaler who he bought products from. Um, and one of the services that they offered was a direct delivery service. Yeah. And what that basically meant was that I could advertise something for sale online, um, didn't actually have to physically buy the stock, um, and then I could sell it. And then when I sold the item, I could order it from the supplier and then they would ship it directly to the customer. So I put simply, I've become a glorified middleman. Um, and I scaled that for a few years, um, got it up to sort of 60,000 plus products for sale on eBay and Amazon at any one time. 60,000 products? 60,000. Wow. Yeah. Um, all managed by software. Um, it was, it was, it was, it was a pretty streamlined process so the listings were all automatically updated to the supplier so if they went out of stock so did mine if their price changed so did mine and we we had it marked up to just make a sort of small margin on each transaction um also uh, orders were automatically placed with supplies so we kind of just had to manage the process um and sort of at our peak we was turning over sort of three quarters of a million pound plus a year that's a lot of money yeah yeah we we did well from it and yeah. um you know, it was a it was an enjoyable process, but you know, I suppose it, it didn't last too long. Um, as part of eBay's sort of struggle with Amazon, they cracked down on their rules and um, they changed their policies as to the rules in terms of not holding stock. So that business started to uh, struggle, and um, it sort of kickstarted me onto moving onto some other things that I've been sort of working on in the background. Okay. And that, you know, your business from, from being a carpenter training to mm -hmm. running an eBay and Amazon type business has now evolved again. So you are constantly changing what you're doing and, and currently have three businesses you're working on? I do, yeah. Um, so whilst I was running the eBay business uh, and Amazon business, I sort of started to delve into software. Software was sort of like the backbone of what was maintaining our current business. And um, put simply, it was costing us an absolute fortune. Uh, to maintain this software and to basically source it from an American company. So I started looking into developing our own. Um, that moved into a, a new product that we was going to work on, which was a business to business marketplace. Um, so the idea at the time was, you know, I suppose my previous, my, my eBay business was sourcing products from UK suppliers and other suppliers. Um, and then automating that process, putting them onto eBay, let them, you know, stay in sync and then, you know, make money through that. So we thought, you know, we may as well go a step back and actually build a marketplace to facilitate this a lot easier than what we've managed to do it. So I sort of started looking into how to develop software. I very naively in the early days thought I'd try and learn how to code myself. Uh, I didn't get on very well with that at all. <laughs> um, so I put, gave up on that one and, and we got a, we got a developer on board. We started developing all of our software. Um, so initially, we uh, the platform was called Delato, and the aim behind it was to put suppliers, wholesalers on there, and the retailers on there, and enable them to enable the suppliers to add products, and then the retailer to access those products, and everything's in the same format. So the retailers could automatically add products to their websites, to their eBay stores, to their Amazon stores, and have that kept, uh, kept in sync. And then they could also, when they sell an item, place an order back through the platform. Um, and then that order would go through to the supplier where then they can fulfill it and send it out to the customer. Um, it, it went quite well. It was, it was a bit of a logistical nightmare. There were so many moving parts, um, but we learned a lot from it. We had best part of, I think we had around 700 retailers sign up. 
we had probably 20 or 30 sort of medium sized wholesalers on board. Um, I think it generated around 100k in volume in the first sort of six months. Um, but again, that was at the mercy of eBay because that's where the biggest audience was. And as eBay started to, you know, they were trying to keep up with Amazon and they changed how their search algorithm worked so that it was more of an Amazon approach in, in a buy box, which meant that our multiple sellers couldn't really compete against each other. Okay. And then it was a drive down in price and that's sort of a downhill battle from there on. So that one didn't work too well in the end. So it seems like an evolution from the first business into this second one, you've tweaked and, and adapted yeah. as you've gone along. Now talk to me about QR codes then, because that's the next evolution, I think. Yeah, so I suppose whilst um, I'm, I like to always be working on many different projects, sometimes it's not always a good thing, but um, whilst building that platform, I had uh, had this idea one evening sat at home um, to basically build a payment system, um, but to make it as fast as I could possibly build it. So if you imagine a traditional website, it's, you know, you, you go on there, you have to add it to your basket, you have to enter your delivery details manually, you have to then create an account, you have to then choose this and choose that, and it's slow, it's it's, it's frustrating, and it, and it causes people to sort of give up. And I sort of had this idea about making that process as quick as we could possibly do it, and connecting it up to a QR code. So this was, pre-COVID, so you know, maybe a little bit of good timing, but we, we built this piece of software that was QR code activated, so you could scan the QR code um, and then put, put simply, it was a three-step process. So you, you scan the code, you view the image of the product, with one click you view the description of the product, with one more click you pay. We would use um, instant payment methods like uh, Apple Pay, Google Pay, um, and then we'd also use the phone sort of native information it has on you so we could pull the delivery details from the phone um, and the payment details from the phone so from a consumer's perspective they didn't have to type anything um, the original concept for it was to put it on coffee cups so a lot of coffee companies they sell um, you know coffee beans and other coffee related products so you know they and they also give out millions and millions of disposable cups which though it isn't great for the environment it, it prevents a bit of a, you know, an advertising opportunity where they can put QR code on there and then when the consumer leaves, they can scan the code and then they can purchase different products or do all sorts of things. Um, and that's, that's, that's what I joined the Innovation Labs this year to grow. Um, and then that's really taken its own this year. So COVID has hit us all. And again, you've changed and adapted your business as you've gone along again to, to see that as a bit of an opportunity. So. Um, obviously, you, know, you and I have talked. So, talk to me about um, veg boxes. Yeah. So, um, the the e-commerce software we've been developing, which was this you know, instant checkout coupon, um, I, I suppose that the, the the bare bones of it is it's just a very simple way for anyone to sell a product online. And as COVID hit, um, obviously, our idea about you know digitizing physical product become a little bit of a, I suppose it wasn't so relevant anymore because people weren't dealing so much in physical products. They weren't buying the coffee cups, they weren't seeing, you know, physical advertising, you know, because everyone's at home. So I uh, approached a, a friend of mine, actually, I, I played rugby with him when I was younger, and he, his family were traditional green grocers, um, been in the family for generations, and he set up his market store probably three or four years ago. Um, he'd started selling fruit and veg boxes, doing home delivery services, um, accepting orders over Facebook, um, quite sort of, uh, it probably wasn't the most efficient way you could do it, but he was doing well out of it. He was, he was delivering 20 or 30 boxes a week. Um, and I approached him with the software and I said, look, let's, let's set something up. Let's, you know, I'll build out the, the software for you, the e-commerce solution so that you can sell boxes a lot more efficiently. You can enable people to create their own boxes. Um, and let's see how we do. And probably very good timing, really, because COVID, COVID hit, everyone was locked in at home, everyone was obviously panic buying, um, the supermarkets were sh short in stock, but he wasn't, he was still going up to London each night, getting fresh produce, and the, 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 the ordering system that we built for him just, it just took off massively. He, he went from, what was he doing, he was uh, 30, 30 orders a week, sort of pre-COVID, and then once we implemented the new software, he was up to 700 deliveries a week. Wow. And doing some very good volume. Transformational for his business. 
Yeah. 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 And that, that, that then led on to other things. So, you know, that set the foundation. He's based in Sudbury for, um, we had cafes who were approaching us. We had farm shops who were approaching us. We had all sorts of different businesses wanting to use this software for, for many different things because obviously everybody was moving online. And um, yeah, it, 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 got, it got us a lot of buyers and that's led on to some pretty cool things as well. So um, that, for people that are watching this, beer and gin, in particular, two of the I know businesses that you work with, and you've helped them to sort of scale up through a, a really tricky year as well. Yeah. So um, alongside that, sort of earlier on in the year, we started working with a local brewery, and um, they were facing a similar challenge. Of obviously, all the pubs were pubs, bars were shut. They have warehouses full of you know beer that ultimately goes out of date. So we started working with them to build a, a clip and collect system through the same software. Um, so what they were doing is they were selling. Um, I think it was four, nine, 18, and 36 pie containers of fresh beer and um, promoting it through Facebook. Obviously, so many people were at home, so they were getting huge amounts of traffic on their posts. You know, everybody still wants to drink. They can't go to the pubs. You can't buy fresh beer in the supermarkets very easily. Um, so they were doing, you know, they were doing unbelievably well. And, you know, that, 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 that led on to other things with them where we then, ended up working with them more on a full-time basis and we developed a table ordering system out of the same software again. So again, pivot. And um, that was sort of where QPay now is. Fantastic. I suppose one of the things in Global Enterprise Week that you've done really well is this using your network of people you knew from rugby, family and friends to start your business off. And then it's ex expanded because you've got great products from there. And I, I guess lots of new businesses will start in that way of we talk to our family and our friends they think it's a good idea and then it expands yeah um i couldn't agree more i i think it was probably one of the biggest things that i was missing um prior to you know as of i think it was around february this year i joined the innovation labs um you know a year ago uh before that I worked at my parents' house in a little office that I built. I've been working there for the best part of four years. I didn't speak to too many people, um, whereas this year I really have. Um, and, you know, this year has been the best year that I've ever had work-wise. You know, obviously I've met the, the three mentors here who have been, you know, incredibly valuable to the business. Um, but then I've also been talking to other people, you know, it's, it's a great community, you know, and, and ultimately people open doors. You know, and it's through working together that's really sort of led on to some, some really good things for me this year. So let's talk about, just to finish off, talk about Virtual High Street. Yeah, so again, it's, it is kind of all linked. So a lot, whilst I was um, helping the green grocers and the breweries and, you know, the, the farm shops, and I was putting content out on LinkedIn, which, you know, again, I'd start doing for the first time this year, and that started to get some traction. And I got approached by the council. Um, I got approached by both, well, actually, it was both Sub uh, Sudbury Town Council and Mid Suffolk Baby Council. And um, we started conversations about developing a, a digital high street. Um, but, but I suppose but simply building something really bespoke. So, purpose built um, and to you know, enable what we've done for all of these other small businesses, but to do it at scale. Um, and enable them to you know, arguably try and compete with the bigger players who traditionally they can't. Um, so for the last sort of probably four months, um, we've been developing a virtual high street for Mid South Baby District Council. Um, a completely bespoke build. It launched launched about two or three weeks ago. It's had some absolutely incredible traffic. And this is in Sudbury to start with as the first first virtual high street. Yeah. So it's it's launched in uh, Sudbury initially. Um, it's then going to be rolled out to uh, Hadley, Needham Market, Stone Market, and I, um, and then hopefully beyond that as well. Um, but we've had, I think in our first two weeks, we had about 100 businesses sign up um, and they're still signing up at quite a fast rate. So it's um, it's going well and it's, and it's really great as well to see businesses using the sort of inbuilt solutions that we've put together. So we've got, for example, um, a, a local Sudbury business who I had a phone call with last week. He, um, he called me up and said, I want to sell online. Um, you know, I've got a high street shop, it's struggling. You know, how can we how can we use the virtual high street to sell products? And we'd put together some explainer videos and we sent them over to him. I said, look, follow these, give them a go. And he he followed the he followed the process and over his weekend he he set the whole thing up himself. And it was and it was great to see because he went from having just a high street shop to having a 
complete online store with a website connected up to his Facebook page, you know, and, and, and he put himself in a position where he can now sell stuff. You know, and it's, you know, the more business we, businesses we can do that for and the better. Absolutely, and that helps the whole of the town and, and Suffolk in due course. Can I just ask, how long since you left um, West Suffolk College? How many years? Do you know what? I don't actually know. I left school at 16, went straight on to do a carpentry apprenticeship, which I think was three or four years. I reckon I left at 18, 19. Well, no, I reckon I left at 20, maybe. So I reckon five years ago, six years ago. Okay. So for, for everybody that's, uh, that's listening to this, so five years on from finishing at West Suffolk College, um, Virtual High Street is almost a com com in its own way a com competitor for the likes of Amazon. Hopefully one day. Hopefully, yeah. Um, and look how far you've come in those five years. So for anybody listening to this, I think this is really inspirational in terms of what can be achieved with starting something, changing it, adapting as you go along and continuing to build out your business. So Ellis, thank you so much for your time this morning for talking this through. Um, and hopefully for those listening, this is really, an, sort of, look what can be achieved if you go for it. And Global Enterprise Week is a, a great time to get that started. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ellis. That's a great story and amazing what you've achieved in such a short space of time. It just shows what can be achieved when you really put your mind to it and never, ever give up. Good luck for the next steps with your business. So I promised you earlier a competition to win an iPad. So here are the details. We want to set you a challenge on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the social media platform that businesses use and a great place for you budding entrepreneurs to, uh, to, to set out. Um, so here's the challenge. Social media platform LinkedIn makes connecting with other businesses um, and professionals easy to do. It's never too early to get started and as students, there's so much for you to gain from getting a strong online profile. LinkedIn can help you to build a strong network of contacts. Let you get job alerts and allows companies to find you, as well as assisting and preparing for interviews or showing your dedication in your positions and, and things that you've already done. We thought it might be fun to set you all the challenge of making the best LinkedIn profile for the chance to win the iPad. The challenge starts uh, today at the start of Global Enterprise Week and runs for the duration. So come Friday, Tracy Marshall and I will announce the winner. Um, so you've got a week to get creative and get connected. Here's a few tips just to start you off. Use a professional profile picture. Don't forget to complete your profile. Um, populate all content blocks with creative statements about you and your future career plans, particularly the about section. Start posting. Do your research and see what works for others. Have a look at other people's posts and see how you can adapt them for yourself. Start to join some groups and follow companies that you might share an interest in. So if you want to work in motor industry, follow John Banks Honda in Berry. Um, we'll see how you've progressed during the course of the week when we review your profiles and begin building up a strong network as soon as you've completed your profile by connecting with people. Don't just leave your account sitting there dormant. Um, so connect with your family and your friends and then start connecting with business people. And you can search in the top bar by Suffolk and by Beres Edmonds and see which businesses are on there. So how to enter this? Um, all we have to do is sign up for a LinkedIn account or use your existing profile if you're already set up on there. Do some research. We've arranged for some LinkedIn talks to help you get started, but you can also do your own research by looking on LinkedIn itself. When you've completed your profile, can you submit it to marketing at wsc.ac.uk? Um, and that has to be submitted by 5 p.m. on Thursday, the 19th of November. The judging panel will be looking for a professional profile which follows LinkedIn rules while being creative and attention grabbing. And we will announce the winner next Friday or this Friday. And we will announce the winner this Friday, the 20th. Good luck. We have a great week of speakers lined up for you. 
please do join as many sessions as possible to get their insights and knowledge. Good luck with the LinkedIn challenge. I hope that goes really well and it will set you on the right path. I'll be back on Friday with Tracy Marshall, Head of Business, Travel and Tourism to review the week, announce the winner live. So have a great week and good luck. <laughs>